Nikolau uh, from Fordham University. I'll be chairing the session. Mm -hmm. As you notice, we did start late. There was a technical issue. Um, this means, of course, that we're not going to end uh, right at 135. We're going to go a little bit beyond 135. Uh, so, you know, lunch will be cut short, but if there's something that should be cut short, it should be lunch, not discussion on Maximus the Confessor. Um, also, um, I'll be doing a little bit more, just to prepare you, I'll be doing a little more, um, um, perhaps it could be called American style moderation, where I, I will not be summarizing the papers afterwards. Um, so I'll let the papers speak for themselves. Uh, each, of the, each of the presenters will present, and then we'll have uh, ample time uh, for discussion, okay? Our first uh, speaker will go according to the program. Our first speaker will be Torstein uh, Theodor Tolofsen, who uh, is at the Univers University of Oslo, the Faculty of Humanities. And the title of his paper is Essence, Potentiality, and Activity in Maximus's Conception of Hypostasis. Uh, excellences, fathers, colleagues, and friends. Uh, the paper is on 10 pages, but I have to skip a lot of it, so I hope the argument still will be somehow intelligible. I want to talk about St. Maximus' concept of uh, hypostasis. Uh, in that regard, there are some terms that I will uh, comment on, uh, namely, of course, hypostasis and, per and prosopon, uh, and also on uh, two terms that one usually translates as particular and individual, tokatekaston and toatomon. But one cannot understand this uh, concept of hypostasis of human person uh, without properly understanding uh, its relationship with other concepts such as essence and nature and activity, and potency and activity. Uh, and I shall start uh, with a small comment on the concepts of essence and nature. And if you, have my, um, if you have my presentation there, it's on page three now. In Opusculum 14, Maximus says that essence and nature are the same, both being common and universal, predicated on many and numerically different things, and never circumscribing one person. We may say, for instance, that Peter, John, and Paul are human beings, and human being is a universal that may be defined as a rational animal. We may say quite generally that patristic doctrine of the patristic doctrine of human nature emphasizes the properties of being an animal with intellect, reason, and will as essentially human. These are necessary and sufficient conditions for an entity of being a human being, and necessary but not sufficient to be a human hypostasis. In Opusculum 23, we find a definition of essence that could be interpreted slightly different from the first one. It is clear that essence is the form itself and the nature, Maximus says, that is the very thing which exists by itself, while the hypostasis indicates a someone of the essence, end of quote. Uh, there are two things to wonder about here. The one is the relation between the two definitions. <coughs> um, and the other one is, of course, how essence in the second sense is to be interpreted. If we are to distinguish between essence and hypostasis, since we would think that hypostasis is a concretely existing entity, there is a question of how we should accommodate these two definitions to one another. And then I move to page five. I will quote again from Apostolum 23. It is clear that the essence is the form itself and the nature, that is, the very thing which exists by itself, while the hypostasis indicates a someone of the essence, end of quote. 
One is probably justified to say here that the hypostasis that is, is that person, that someone, who carries the form or the essence in the concrete sense. Further on in the same opusculum he says, for hypostasis is in all ways nature as well, like figure is in all ways body. For hypostasis is not to be known without nature, and neither are figure or color to be known without body. But nature is not in all ways hypostasis as well. For nature has the logos of being that is common, while hypostasis, in addition, has the logos of being that belongs to itself. The nature, then, has only the logos of the species, while the hypostasis is such that, in, that it, in addition, shows a someone. End of quote. We have found two instances of the indefinite pronoun tis meaning someone, indicating a hypostasis, not an essence. What Maximus says could be interpreted thus. Peter is in all respects man or human being. There is nothing in Peter that is not human. On the other hand, to be man or human being is not in all respects to be Peter. To be man is not limited to him. Since John, Paul and countless other individuals can be said to be man or human being as well. And in his tenth uh, uh, Opusculum, Maximus make a distinction between being something and being someone. This can be taken together with what we found above, namely that it is a feature of being a hypostasis that it indicates a someone. And Opusculum 10 also brings into consideration the concepts of, I would say, potency and activity. Um, and it says that we are active as being something, that is essentially. However, when an entity gives form to the mode of activity, it manifests itself as a someone when it gives form to the mode of activity. In other words, the character of being a hypostasis consists in the capacity to give form to the mode of activity. I interpret Maximus in the following way. A human being is a hypostasis when he or she assumes the human essence with the potentiality or power of this essence in such a way that he or she forms its activities as belonging to himself or herself qua a someone. In order to be an hypostasis, an entity must be a someone that gives form to this mode of activity. However, this condition is necessary, but not sufficient, for an entity to be a human hypostasis in a Maximian sense. And then I turn to Opusculum 26. Maximus gives two rather, I would say, both interesting and confusing definitions of individual and hypostasis. I always found it different, difficult to figure out exactly how they use this terminology of individual and hypostasis. It seems that they do not, do not bother as much as modern people do, uh, theologians do, to distinguish between these two things. So I wonder what does that, does that mean? And the quotations. An individual is, according to the philosophers, a collection of properties. And this bundle cannot be contemplated in another. According to the fathers, such are Peter and Paul, or someone else, each of whom is distinct from other men by virtue of their own personal properties. And the next quotation, an hypothesis is, according to the philosophers, an essence with properties. Well, doesn't that sound rather Cappadocian? An hypothesis is, according to the philosophers, an essence with properties. According to the fathers, it is the particular man who, as a person, is distinct from other men. 
How should this be interpreted? What is the difference between according to the philosophers and according to the fathers? One possible interpretation could be that the philosophers define an individual as well as an hypothesis in an abstract and general way. An individual as well as an hypothesis is one, a collection of properties, and two, a logical subject of predication. Um, a logical subject of properties probably conceived as abstract predicates. If, for instance, a particular entity is defined this way, it is defined as a man with the general properties, or let us say, curly hair, being a fisherman, being the son of someone, etc. Each of these by themselves could be said of many persons. Even if none of the predicates are exclusive for the particular entity in question, the idea seems to be that the total combination is unique. But even so, this seems to be given in a rather general and logical way. And as I mentioned, in Opusculum 10, Maximus distinguishes between being something and being someone. Maybe we could say that the particular human being is defined, according to the philosophers, as something. That is, as an instantiation of the human essence, with all this collection of properties around it. The fathers, on the other hand, defined individual and hypostasis as a nameable subject. That seems to be what is the, uh, one of the points that should be noted here. I'm not sure how much one can get out of it. A nameable subject, for instance, Peter, and as a someone that is, that is distinct from other such someones by personal properties. The question is how Maximus understands the term personal properties, and then, unfortunately, I have to skip what uh, is uh, quoted from Aristotle here. It could be illuminating, I think. But then it's good that you have the manuscript. I go to page 8, and I need some water. In addition to being a nameable someone, Distinguished by personal properties, who gives form to his mode of activity. Each hypostasis is created in accordance not only with the logos of man or human being, but with the logos of his human person, hypostasis. Here we meet uh, the doctrine of man being created in the image and likeness of God. As we shall see, it brings with it not only a distinctive dynamics, but also a mystery, since what we are in our deepest self is hidden in the divine intention or logos for our being, as a hypostasis. To be human and to be a person is basically therefore not our achievement, but is rather a gracious gift from God. Even so, there is something to be achieved by our own effort, namely, as you saw above, how we give form to the mode of activity. However, something is definitely given before any activity occurs. The mystery that each of us is, is kept in the divine being. Whenever we act out of the potential that is ontologically given, we give form to the mode of action in accordance with or discordant with, or what comes to the same, in accordance with, in, in, in accordance with, discordant with nature, or which comes to the same, in accordance with, or discordant with the logos of our being. The divine purpose of our life consists in this, that we should enter the mode of activity that is in accordance with the logos of our nature and realize our essential potential as an hypostasis. Christ, Maximus says, restores me marvelously, he says as well, to myself, or rather to God. Maximus obviously thinks it is possible for man not to be his proper self. 
One may live a life of delusion separated from one's true purpose. My own self, my true self, is kept in God in the principles that is the Logoi mystically contemplated by him. This ontology has a lot of important aspects, one of which concerns what you could call the principle of or even the ontology of uh, communion. Man is made in such a way that when he lives in accordance with his logos and executes his essential potential in the proper way, he may recognize that his being is divinely interconnected with the being of all other beings defined by the logo. In other words, he may discover contemplatively in himself his interconnectedness with all being established by God. Man was originally designed as a microcosm but failed as such. However, the economy of Christ restored ecclesiastically the microcosmic being of human nature and re-established the conditions of ontological communion between all creatures. Maximus understands the self as a mystery to be achieved in one stretching out for God. This self is not an autonomous entity in its own right. It is rather an entity that is realized in a life characterized by being in accordance with what is not as such human, namely with divine principles. Thank you. Thank you, Terstein. <clears throat> and now we have Father Dimitrios Barthrelos, who teaches at the University of Cambridge Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge, UK. And the title of his talk is St. Maximus's Contributions to the Notion of Freedom. Um, I would like to, to say that I'm very honored to be a part of this conference and to express my thanks to the organizers and especially to uh, Bishop Maximus for having invited me to the conference. Um, so my paper is on St. Maximus the Confessor's contributions to the notion of freedom. Introduction. In August 656, while exiled at Bizia, Maximus was visited by Bishop Theodosius, a representative of the court and the monothelite church of the capital. To his question, how are you my Lord Father? Maximus replied that, as God preordained before all ages a way of life for me in his providence, that's how I am. Theodosius, a little startled, asked again, how can you say that? Did God preordain our individual destinies before all time? To this Maximus replied that, if he had foreknowledge, assuredly he preordained as well. Theodosius asked again, what is the exact meaning of the words had for knowledge and preordained? Maximus replied, for knowledge pertains to thoughts and words and actions which come from us. Predestination pertains to those accidents which do not come from us. Then to Theodosius' question, how can you say that? Is that why you suffer in this place of exile? because you have committed some deeds worthy of this suffering. Maximus replied, I pray that by this suffering God may limit the punishments of which I was guilty in sinning against him by transgressing his commandments which bring justification. In this most interesting dialogue we get a glimpse of how St. Maximus understands the relation between divine providence and human freedom. The Pauline term that Maximus uses here, proorisen, brings to mind the fundamental and controversial Protestant doctrine of predestination. However, Maximus would not accept anything like this doctrine since the predestination he talks about concerns only the circumstances of our lives, not the way in which we freely respond to them. Although he believes that our freedom has limits set upon it by God himself, Maximus is neither a predestinarian nor a determinist. 
man is free and the way in which he uses his freedom determines his eternal fate. It all depends on how he relates to God and on whether he obeys his commandments or not. Now, Maximus' emphasis on obedience brings to mind Christ's obedience to the Father, exemplified primarily at the Garden of Gethsemane. The monothelite controversy of the 7th century offered to Maximus the opportunity to produce the last and fullest synthesis of patristic Christology in a manner that places the question of the human will and freedom at the center. A full account of Maximus' understanding of and contributions to the concept of human freedom in general would require a large book. In this short paper, I will only stick to Christology, not only for the sake of brevity, but also because in Jesus Christ, and in Jesus Christ alone, are we able to see the true man and human freedom in its authenticity. <coughs> Two, the philosophical background. Ancient and late antique philosoph Greek philosophy was often excessively intellectualistic. As I have argued elsewhere, according to the fundamental intellectualistic thrust of this philosophy, human will was effectively reduced to a byproduct of cognition. As Socrates, for instance, has been reported to believe, nobody fails or does evil on purpose. Every evil action is due either to ignorance or to the fact that the evildoer acts against reason because his irrational impulses are stronger than reason. Furthermore, Aristotle seems to see a link of necessity between the judgment rendered by the intellect and the immediate action followed thereupon, which allows no room for a faculty of will. For the Stoics, volitions or desires are a kind of beliefs. Seneca, for instance, famously claimed that I do not obey God, rather I agree with him. Moreover, Plotinus is committed to the idea that the reasonable soul cannot willingly or knowingly sin. If a Christian version of these ideas were endorsed, salvation would be understood to come about basically through the transmission of knowledge. This approach curtails human freedom in a drastic manner. Man will inevitably do what he knows is right, except perhaps in case he is not strong enough to control his subrational impulses and desires. But this reflects neither reality, I would say, nor a Christian understanding of it. It is true that sometimes people know what is good and try to do it, but the compulsive power of sin does not allow them to. Paul has articulated this in a dramatic way in Romans 7, 14 to 25. At other times, though, men know very well what is right and yet choose to do what is wrong. Niccolò Machiavelli is not wholly unjustified in claiming that men are good only when this serves their interests. Even worse, perhaps, people often use excuses or invent ideologies in order to justify their sinful choices, and sometimes they even come to believe them. The idealized picture of man as a fundamentally good and rational being, which the antiquity Smith and Enlightenment produced, was shattered on the philosophical level by the masters of the hermeneutics of suspicion, including Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, and on the historical level by the First World War. In the early church, it was tested and found wanting, primarily in the ascetic struggle of the Christian monks, and it was also officially condemned in the 5th century as a Pelagian heresy. 3. The theological background. By Maximus' times, two divergent approaches to Christology had been deployed. The first was shared by theologians who tended to emphasize the unity of Christ in a way that occasionally overshadowed the reality or the significance of his humanity. According to the heretical version of this approach, put forward by Apollinarius of Laodicea in the 4th century and the Monothelites in the 7th, Christ could not have had a human will, because this would necessarily and inevitably oppose the divine will. Namely, it would turn Christ into a sinner. 
in the orthodox form of the same Christological approach as we find it, for instance, in St. Athanasius, the human will of Christ does not seem to have a distinct, clearly developed soteriological significance. But if some of the aforementioned theologians were not always or at all able to articulate the theological significance of the freedom of Jesus, some others, often grouped as the school of Antioch, turned it into a key aspect of their Christology. In my view, it still <coughs> seems true that Theodore and Nestorius shared a rather weak understanding of Christ's unity. This unity was largely dependent on Jesus' obedience to the divine will. It was not a physical or a hypostatic unity, as Cyril, for instance, typically called it, but rather a moral unity. This underscored the importance of Jesus' human freedom, but it did so in a way that, on the one hand, undermined the hypostatic unity between divinity and humanity, brought about by the incarnation of the Logos, and on the other hand, led to an unacceptable moralism which threatened to reduce Christ to something like an Old Testament prophet and Christianity to a Judaic type of religion, according to which our unity with God is both founded and perhaps almost exhausted in the keeping of his commandments. Originism was one last component of Maximus's theological background. Origenism's religious myth claimed that initially all spirits were united with God, but then they fell because of satiety. After a long period of purification, however, they will return to their initial state, but they may fall again, which will entail the repetition of the whole story ad infinitum. Here we find a self-contradictory maximization and at the same time minimization of human freedom. Man will be always, even in the state of full unity with God, free to say no to him and to reject him. But he also will always have to return to him in the end. It seems that satiety and punishment do not leave much room for man either to remain freely with God or to move freely away from him. 4. Maximus's view of human freedom in its fallen post lapsarian form and in Christ. For Maximus, human will has two aspects, the rational, self-determining one, and the sub-rational and instinctive. The latter moves to acts of willing without the free personal intervention of the person. The will for life and the aversion to death, the will to eat, to drink, to sleep, etc., are natural, instinctive, volitional movements. They are not sinful in themselves, but often have to be resisted for the sake of ascesis or of obedience to God. Christ's fiat in Gethsemane exemplifies this. His instinctive will to avoid death is natural and blameless. However, by virtue of his free, rational human will, Christ was able to take the human decision to oppose the instinctive object of willing that desired life through a volitional act of self-denial that conformed to the will of God. Maximus characterizes the human will as, as self-determining, after exusion. This means that human will is not subject to any internal or external determinism. However, it does not mean that human will operates in an ontological, existential, and moral vacuum. After the fall, human will is marred by sin and functions in a way that Maximus has described as gnomi or gnomic will, as well as prioresis. We do not need to mention here all the relevant technical details of, of his terminology, but in general, for Maximus, the gnomic will is the human natural will in its post-lapsarian form and function. The post-lapsarian volitional process is marked by ignorance and deliberation, oscillation between good and evil, and the possibility, or perhaps even the probability, of choosing evil instead of good. 
Maximus applies all this to man after the fall. But when he comes to Christ, he gives us a different picture. Christ's humanity is not stained by the blameful consequences of the fall. In him we find neither ignorance and deliberation, nor oscillation between good and evil, nor even the possibility of choosing evil. His human will is not simply sinless, but also deified on account of its unity with the divinity. As a result of this deification, Christ's fundamental moral orientation, predisposition, or maxim, to put it in slightly Kantian terms, is towards the good, towards doing the will of God. <clears throat> Ignorance, oscillation between good and evil, and possibility of choosing evil are excluded from the beginning. Christ takes concrete human decisions. There are in his life specific acts of his human will, such as the Gethsemane fiat, but these do not presuppose a fallen gnomic will. In Christ, human will reaches its best and highest form because it is taken up by God the Logos. He, as personal willing subject, moves and forms it in accordance with the divine will of God the Father. 4. Further anthropological implications. Now, let us see in some more detail some of the anthropological implications of Maximus's aforementioned teaching, which will further manifest his contributions to the notion of freedom. 1. For Maximus, the human will is natural. It belongs to nature, not to person. Maximus openly disagrees with Pyrrhus's claim that what is natural is also necessarily unfree or compelled, to the physicon pandos ke inangasmenon. For Maximus, nothing which is natural is involuntary in the rational nature. However, Maximus refers here to the rational part of human nature, and thus he leaves out the instinctive movements of our sub-rational humanity, the emergence of which are, is independent <coughs> of our volitional consent. Moreover, for Maximus, even our rational self-determining will is not free in the sense of being devoid of orientation. It is by nature oriented to God, although this orientation is affected and often misdirected by sin. Two. On the other hand, if will belongs to nature, the mode of willing, namely the actualization of the human will in concrete acts of willing, belongs to person. Human nature has the ability, the potentiality, and the power of willing, by virtue of which the person, as the subject of willing, proceeds to specific volitional acts. Even our natural orientation towards God has to become particularized by each person in specific acts of willing. These personal acts of willing are not meant to oppose nature, but, but to use its God-given capacity of willing in a way pleasing to God. For Maximus, the first step is not to achieve freedom from nature, but freedom from passions, it on pathon pandelis eleftheria, as he puts it. Man should conform will to nature in order to avoid what is against nature. Furthermore, he should voluntarily use the law of grace in order to renew the law of nature. But moreover, and this is the second and final step, he should also move willingly beyond nature and towards God. Thus, he will experience an ecstasy from nature and achieve deification, which is beyond nature, hyperfishing. Three, for Maximus, human will is a distinct faculty and not simply a byproduct of cognition and intellect. Jesus' fiat at Gethsemane is important not because it is rational, namely in conformity with the demands of reason, but because it is an obedient response to the will of God. Man's existential predicament is not to do only with the lack of knowledge, but also with his voluntary decision to be against God. Psychological and religious attempts at self-discovery are not necessarily helpful. 
This does not mean that truth does not contribute to our freedom. Christ himself has said that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It simply means that knowledge cannot determine or compel human freedom. It is not by and of itself salvific. Four, what was mentioned above has obvious implications for soteriology and in particular the question of apocatastasis, which in our times has become once more very popular even among theologians. At this point, I will only quote Father George Florovsky at some length. St. Gregory of Nyssa, writes Florovsky, anticipated a kind of universal conversion of souls in the afterlife when the truth of God will be revealed and manifested with compelling evidence. Just at that point, the limitation of the Hellenic mind is obvious. Evidence seemed to it to be the decisive motive for the will, as if sin were merely ignorance. The Hellenic mind had to pass through a long and hard experience of asceticism, of ascetic self-examination and self-control, in order to overcome this intellectualistic naivete and illusion and discover a dark abyss in the fallen soul. Only in St. Maximus the Confessor, after some centuries of ascetic preparation, do we find a new and deepened interpretation of the apocatastasis. Indeed, the order of creation will be fully restored in the last days, but the dead souls will still be insensitive to the very revelation of light. The divine light will shine to all, but those who once have chosen darkness will be still unwilling and unable to enjoy the eternal bliss. They will still cling to the nocturnal darkness of selfishness. They will be unable precisely to enjoy. They will stay outside because union with God, which is the essence of salvation, presupposes and requires the determination of will. Human will is irrational and its motives cannot be rationalized. Even evidence may fail to impress and move it. Five, human will and freedom are in desperate need of healing. This healing has both an internal and an external dimension. Maximus believed that the internal ontological purity of man is as important as his outside moral behavior. He was fiercely opposed to the Nestorian view that Christ was internally sinful, namely affected by the sinful desires and impulses that result from fallen humanity, and only, and only externally and actually sinless, namely in so far as he never committed a sinful act. For Maximus, Christ was a pathis, passionless, not simply a gratis continent. He did not have to fight against sinful passions because he had none. To say that Christ had a fallen, that is, a gnomic will, was for Maximus a great blasphemy, even if one hastened to say that this always chose the good in the end. Maximus did not share the Christological and by implication anthropological moralism of the school of Antioch, which posited that Christ had to struggle in order to overcome sinful inclinations. For Maximus, Christ's humanity was pure and holy from the very beginning, and his moral struggle, exemplified in Gethsemane par excellence, was a volitional expression of this holiness. 6. Nestorian Old Testament-inspired moralism, however, had one more aspect. It reduced the unity between the Logos and the assumed man to the identity of their object of willing, taftovulia, resulting from the obedience of Jesus to God the Logos. Maximus's response to this was that Christ's human obedience to the Father did not lead to, but was preceded by the deification of his humanity. If we attempt to see the implications of this view for anthropology, we may justifiably argue that it naturally leads to what Nicholas Cabasilas would later argue in detail in his masterpiece on the life of Christ. The first step of the life in Christ 
is the sacramental cleansing and restoration of our humanity and of its faculties. And then follows the moral struggle that leads to holiness. A moralistic approach that underemphasizes the sacramental and charismatic presuppositions of moral life is inadequate and misleading. Seven, human freedom is not fundamentally served by the multiplication of choices on offer, especially if these are evil choices. The modern maxim, I'm not free because I have few choices, or no choices perhaps, or one choice only, it would have for Maximus rather little value. Usually only rich people have many choices, but for authentic freedom, this is off the point. Any emphasis on the significance of choices that disregards that the only fundamental and all-important choice is the choice for or against God is essentially atheist. True freedom is not to do with having many choices, but with the ability to discern and make the right choice. To have access to evil choices and the possibility to choose them do not constitute the best type of freedom. Perfect freedom is that for which there is not even the possibility of choosing evil. Here Maximus is fundamentally at one with Augustine, who believed that the will that cannot sin at all is more free than the will that can either sin or not sin. He who cannot choose evil is holier than and superior to him who can choose evil, even if he eventually chooses good. A freedom for which the choice of evil is out of the question is the freedom of Christ and of the saints in the kingdom. The inability to choose good is its opposite. It is the freedom of the devil. It is the self-inflicted freedom of hell. And finally, eight. From Maximus's point of view, we can safely conclude that human freedom is perfected through its conformity to divine freedom. Maximus insists that the human natural will is oriented towards God who created it. Our freedom is by nature freedom for God. Therefore, the rejection of our God is also the rejection of our freedom or of our authentic freedom. The modern atheistic slogan that only if God is dead can I be free expresses a tragic misunderstanding. In fact, only if God is not dead can I be free because only then may my freedom be raised by grace to the level of the divine perfect freedom. As Maximus claims in a famous passage, he who loves God has become like Melchizedek, without father or mother or genealogy, and is not kept by either the world or nature because of his unity with the Spirit. In the opposite case, his freedom is ensnared in the boundaries of sinful existence. It is defeated by sin and eventually by death. In God alone, there is freedom to live and to live abundantly. Thank you. Thank you, Father Demetrius. And now we have David Bradshaw from the University of Kentucky, uh, Department of Philosophy, and he will speak to us on St. Maximus's theory of the will. Thank you. Well, I also would like to start by thanking um, those who have organized the conference, especially Bishop Maxim and so many others who have uh, done a wonderful job. And I'm especially grateful for the opportunity last night to, relic, uh, to, to uh, reverence the relics of St. Maximus. It's wonderful to be able to honor him in that way. Uh, my paper today is going to try to um, use St. Maximus to address two issues that are uh, live issues in contemporary philosophy, at least in the United States. One of them is a, a historical question. Uh, when did the concept of the will originate? And how and why? Because it's really not part of ancient anthropology. It's not there, for instance, in Plato and Aristotle. Uh, most scholars point to either Roman Stoicism and people like Epictetus and Seneca or to Augustine. But I think that the importance of St. Maximus uh, should not be overlooked. So that's one of the points I want to make here. The other is to address the debate between what's called uh, libertarianism and compatibilism as two different views of the relationship of free will to determinism. Um, 
I'll say a little bit more about that later in the paper, but I think he has a lot to say on, on both of these issues. So my aim in this paper is to identify the distinctive contribution made by St. Maximus to the development of theories of the will. I'll off also offer some tentative comments regarding the contemporary value of this contribution, particularly as regards the question of how the will can be responsive to reason without being determined by reason. I'll draw for this purpose upon some stimulating remarks about St. Maximus's theory by R.A. Gautier and Thomas Madden, as well as the critique of their views by Richard Sarabji. Maximus's teaching about the will was, of course, not undertaken for its own sake, but in response to monothelitism. The latter was, in turn, a refinement of monoenergism, the doctrine that Christ possessed a single divine human energy, or energia. Although the issue soon shifted from energy to that of whether Christ possessed one or two wills, the lamata, it is important to bear this earlier stage of the debate in mind, for Maximus seems to have developed his thought about the two natural wills in Christ, largely in isomorphism, with his conviction regarding the two natural energies. This fact may help explain the direction ultimately taken by his thought about the will, as I'll suggest below. The monothelite assertion of one thelema or thelesis in Christ was intended to safeguard his unity as an acting agent. Although it's not always clear whether the monothelites had in mind Christ's faculty of will, act of willing, or determinate will, they probably meant to include all three. The objection raised by Maximus centered on the difficulty such a view creates for attributing any active role to the humanity of Christ. Maximus pointed repeatedly to the prayer of Christ in Gethsemane. Father, if you will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, as indicating that Christ had a distinctly human thelema, and that this thelema was capable of standing in tension, although not an outright contradiction, to the divine will. In this verse, thelema no doubt refers to what I've labeled determinate will, that is, a specific determination to do something. Nonetheless, for such a difference to be possible, Christ must also have possessed a distinctively human capacity for willing, and that is the point on which Maximus focused. As he saw it, the recognition of two distinct faculties of will is a necessary corollary to the Chalcedonian affirmation of Christ's two distinct na uh, natures, divine and human, for without it, such an affirmation would be empty. Maximus defines this natural faculty of will as, quote, a faculty desirous of what is in accordance with nature, which holds together all the attributes that belong essentially to a being's nature. Although natural will so defined would seem to belong to all living things, Maximus plainly is interested primarily in the form that it takes in rational beings. Hence he goes on to define it further as, quote, a simple, rational, and vital desire. And in the disputation with Pyrrhus, he offers a number of descriptions which presuppose reason, including that it is rational desire, self-determination, and desiderative mind, nous erecticos. Will qua rational desire is the master faculty governing the entire process that leads to intentional action. Uh, he writes, willingly we think and wish and search and consider and deliberate and judge and are inclined toward and choose and move toward and use. Elsewhere he calls it, the, quote, the primary innate power among physical characteristics and movements, holding that by it alone we seek being, life, movement, thought, speech, perception, nourishment, sleep, rest, and all else that sustains nature. Rational wish, bulesis, and choice, prohiresis, which in classical thought are the primary acts of a volitional nature, are understood by Maximus as modes of thelesis. Uh, the former, bulesis, is, quote, imaginative desire both of things that are and are not up to us, or equivalently an act of will, thelesis, directed toward a particular object, which may or may not be in our power. The latter, prohiresis, is desire following upon deliberation and judgment, specifically for an object within our power. It constitutes, as Maximus puts it, a combination of desire, deliberation, and judgment. This way of distinguishing bulesis and prohiresis is largely Aristotelian, and probably reached Maximus through Nemesius of Emesa. Maximus thus incorporates a great deal of the classical analysis of volition under his own overarching category of thelesis. Another of Maximus's innovations was to distinguish from the natural will what he calls the gnomic will. Maximus explains the distinction between natural and gnomic will on analogy with that between the capacity to speak, which belongs to nature, and how one speaks, which belongs to hypostasis. He defines the gnomic will as, quote, the self-chosen impulse 
and movement of reasoning toward one thing or another. As this definition indicates, the gnomic will is not a faculty, which would be redundant given the role already assigned to the natural will, but instead an act made possible by the natural will. The particular direction of the gnomic will is shaped by a person's nome, a fluid term which in this context would seem to mean character or inclination. Nome arises when desire is oriented and established by judgment and deliberation, and it stands toward choice, prohiresis, as a dispositional state, a hexis, toward the corresponding act. In fact, there would seem to be little difference between the nomic will and prohiresis, both being names for the choice that issues from and is shaped by nome. Now, I might mention here that uh, there's a short appendix at the end of the paper where I address a separate question, which is why does Maximus deny a gnomic will in Christ? And I think that if you look at these definitions I just gave closely, uh, Christ, as it's defined here, uh, actually does have a gnomic will. The, the, issue, the problem is that the term is defined differently in different texts. And I'll just uh, leave that for discussion or if you have time to read that little appendix at the end of the paper. Let me just continue with the main line of thought, which isn't really about Christology per se so much as it is about his theory of the will. Maximus's understanding of prohiresis as issuing from and being shaped by nome in the sense of disposition or character raises an important question. Is choice determined by character or is character merely a precondition that, in the phrase of Leibniz, inclines without necessitating? In order to give point to this question, it may help to notice a couple of historical precedents. Aristotle, in a famous passage of the Nicomachean Ethics, likens the formation of character to throwing a stone. He writes, once you have thrown a stone and let it go, you can no longer recall it, even though the power to throw it was yours, for the initiative was within you. Similarly, since an unjust or a self-indulgent man initially had the possibility not to become unjust or self-indulgent, he has acquired these traits voluntarily. But once he has acquired them, it is no longer possible for him not to be what he is. In other words, although character may initially be formed through some sort of indeterministic process, once it is formed, choices follow from it of necessity. Such a view is a version of what I will call character-based determinism, the view that choices are determined by character. A more subtle form of such a view can be found in Augustine. On his view, it is not character as a whole that determines choice, but the strengths of one's loves and desires. Thus, in the City of God, Augustine describes the soul as borne about by the preponderance of its loves, much as a material body is borne about by its weight. Elsewhere, he says even more directly, quote, it is necessary to do, excuse me, it is necessary that we do whatever attracts us more. This, too, is a form of character-based determinism, although it focuses on love and desire rather than character per se. There are a number of signs that Maximus does not hold such a view. One is the definition of gnomic will cited earlier, the self-chosen impulse and movement of reasoning toward one thing or another. That the impulse is self-chosen, autiratos, seems to indicate a certain spontaneity that cannot be understood simply as a result of pre-existing factors. This impression is confirmed by an interesting analogy Maximus offers in the course of explicating the difference between choice that is in accordance with nature and that contrary to nature. Choice, he says, is like a vote in relation to the preceding judgment, regardless of whether that judgment is correct. Here, too, there would seem, a, seem to be a certain spontaneity in the act of choice that cannot be explained by preceding factors. Just as a vote is not wholly explicable, although it is partially so, by the deliberation that precedes it. Finally, and from a broader standpoint, there is the role Maximus gives to free choice and progress toward deification. In this context, he uses nome precisely to indicate the creature's own contribution as distinct from that determined by God. Thus, he writes in Ambiguous 7 that, quote, rational beings are in motion from the beginning naturally by reason of being, diatoenai, and toward the goal in accordance with nome by reason of well-being, diatoenai. Likewise, in Ambiguous 10, we read that of the three logoi by which God has made all creatures, those of being, well-being, and eternal being, the two on, ex on the extremes, that is, being and eternal being, have God alone as cause. But the other uh, is intermediate and depends our own, on our own movement and nome, and through itself makes the extremes what they are. In these passages, nome seems to uh, more likely to mean an act of choice 
rather than a disposition. But either way, it is plain that Maximus envisages a distinctive human contribution to the achievement of well-being, one that cannot be understood solely in terms of divine agency. Here, too, it would seem that human nome includes a crucial element of spontaneity. This means that in contemporary terms, Maximus is closer to being a libertarian than a compatibilist, including a theological compatibilist. And that, if you're not familiar with the term, would simply mean someone who believes that ultimately God determines everything and that that is somehow compatible with our possession of free will. Uh, I, I think that for Maximus it's not true that ultimately God determines everything. However, it would not be right to identify his view simply as libertarian, for it includes an element that contemporary libertarianism normally does not, namely the fundamental structure contained in the three logoi of being, well-being and eternal being. Because human choice always takes place within this structure, it is never wholly de novo, but always a response to the invitation to deification present within God's creative intent. This is an important point about which I'll have more to say in a moment. First, I'd like to return to the question of the place of Maximus within the history of the development of concepts of the will. Gautier argues for the importance of Maximus in this regard, primarily on Maximus's identification of the natural will as a faculty that is, one, innate to human nature, uh, two, must be distinguished sharply from the manner of use of that faculty, that is, the gnomic will, and three, is intrinsically directed toward things that are in accordance with nature. Uh, here, points one and two are, as Gautier sees it, perhaps the inevitable result of Maximus's twofold aim of establishing that Christ possessed a human will, but not a will subject to sin. But nothing constrained Maximus to add point three, the intrinsic directness of the natural will toward natural goods. In doing so, Maximus opened up, as it were, a kind of rationality that is independent of reasoning or conscious knowledge one that, is, that the scholastics who were influenced by Maximus by the mediation of John of Damascus rightly recognized as integral to human nature. As Gautier puts it, natural will is without a doubt uh, the wish, bulisus, of Aristotle. But instead of making this wish arise as does Aristotle upon the indifferent foundation of desire, say Maximus makes it arise in the thelesis, a word that Aristotle did not know just as he did not know the reality that it designates. Thelesis is no longer a desire that is rational by accident, but a desire rational by nature, a faculty, dunamis, moved by its own proper vitality, prior to any intervention of knowledge toward the same universal natural good that it is the function of reason to know. This faculty belongs to human nature, and it is natural, too, that there arises in it, whenever a simple representation occurs, independently of any deliberation, the act of wish, bulisus, thus elevated for the first time to the dignity of the will. And so Gautier is, in essence, identifying Maximus as a key formulator of what later became, I think, the Thomistic and, and a fairly typical scholastic understanding of will as a natural faculty. Uh, so to continue, Gautier adds that there is a direct correlation between the natural will of Maximus and the voluntas of the scholastics, understood as a faculty of rational appetite that is distinct from reason on the one hand and sensible appetite on the other. These interesting remarks have unfortunately not received the attention that they deserve. I'm aware of only two published responses. Thomas Madden cites Gautier with agreement and offers on his own account a similar view, although he sees Aristotelian prohiresis rather than bulisis as the closest precedent for thelesis. As, Ma as Madden sees it, Maximus's Quote, masterstroke was to seize upon the verb root thelo as the basis for his concept. In doing so, he leapt back over all classical philosophy to a root whose spontaneous, immediate, pararational efficacy, efficacy uh, was well known to Homer as well as to the translators of the Septuagint, the writers of the New Testament, and the early fathers of the church. This root provided solid ground, perhaps the only possible ground in the Greek vocabulary, for a faculty which would stand co-equal to intellect, yet independent of it. The other response is that of Richard Sarabji, who takes a more critical view. Sarabji summarizes the claims made by Gautier and Madden under two points. One, Maximus rightly defined the natural will as, quote, a faculty directed of his essence to the good, rather than as something one calls will when it happens to be so directed. And two, the will aims at this good quite independently of reason, 
although reason recognizes the same good. Neither point, according to Sarabji, justifies attributing to Maxis, Maximus any significant role in the development of the concept of the will. The first is not particularly original, for the belief that there is a naturally directed desire for the good was common in ancient thought and can be found, for example, in Aristotle's view that everyone naturally desires a happy life. In fact, Sarabji argues, Maximus's definition of natural will would seem to be an adaptation of the Stoic notion of oikiosis, that attachment that is felt by newborn infants and animals to their own physical constitution, and which the adult human can later extend to his entire rational constitution. In support, Sarabji points to a number of verbal parallels between Stoke descriptions of okeosis and Maximus's definition. The second point can be dismissed even more briefly, according to Sarabji, for to be independent of reason is, quote, not a universally agreed feature of the will, and so is irrelevant to Sarabji's ostensible topic, that of the discovery of the will. It seems to me that Sarabji here runs roughshod over what are, in fact, some valuable insights. The connection of Maximus's natural will to Stoic okoiosis is by no means as clear as Sarabji suggests. More importantly for Maximus, it is crucial that the natural will is a faculty, dunamis. And this is what distinguishes his view from that of others, such as Aristotle and the Stoics, who recognize some sort of naturally directed desire for the good. As Gautier emphasizes, it is crucial that the natural will be a faculty in order for it to be capable of motivating action in a way that is rational, but not determined by reasoning. This is a point that Sarabji simply ignores. Although I find the reference to okoiosis unhelpful, I do, not, I do think that something more can be said about what motivated Maximus to identify the natural will as a faculty, and that doing so may help to bring this idea into focus. As I mentioned earlier, the monothelite debate was a continuation of the monoenergist debate. And in fact, Maximus often addressed the two issues in tandem. Now, it had long been traditional to see energia as the expression of dunamis, an Aristotelian idea that had been codified into the tripartite scheme of usia, dunamis, energia by Galen, Iamblichus, and others, and would have been known to Maximus through Nemesius of Mesa. In light of this correlation, the debate over whether Christ possessed a natural human energia was also by implication a debate over whether he possessed a natural human dunamis. But as Pyrrhus remarks in the disputation, and Maximus accepts, to will, thelane, is a kind of synecdoche, for to act, energane, since willing is itself a kind of activity. It was therefore natural for Maximus, approaching the issue of whether Christ possessed a natural human will, to identify that will as a dunamis that is correlative to the human energia. I admit that this hypothesis is speculative, as Maximus himself does not explicitly draw these connections, but it seems the most likely explanation of how he came to be the first in the history of philosophy to identify the natural will as a kind of dunamis. So there's more to be said for the first point of Gautier and Madden, uh, and again, that's that will is a faculty naturally directed to the good, than Sarabji allows. The second point was that will aims at the good in a way that is independent of reason, a point that Sarabji dismisses by observing that it is not part of the concept of will as such. When the issue is posed in this narrow way, Sarabji is certainly correct. However, Gautier and Madden plainly did not mean to claim that all subsequent thought on the will has followed Maximus's lead. Their claim is rather that Maximus's concept of the will is correct, or at least a significant advance upon its predecessors. This is a philosophical issue that it's not possible to settle here. Nonetheless, I'd like to point out how the element of spontaneity in Maximus's understanding of choice, to which I drew attention earlier, strengthens Gautier's and Madden's point. One of the difficulties facing medieval discussions of the will was that of how reason can be operative in choice without determining choice. Thomas Aquinas, for example, famously suggested that reason moves the will by presenting to it its final cause. Quote, because the understood good is the object of the will and moves it as an end. It is natural to wonder if this is so, whether the will is determined by the conclusions of reason, and if it is so determined, whether it is truly free. Uh, and by the way, I don't think that's actually was Aquinas's view ultimately, but it, it is a natural uh, question to, to raise. It was presumably such worries that prompted the Bishop of Paris to include among the propositions condemned in 1277, the following. 
quote, that the will necessary pursues what is firmly held by reason and that it cannot abstain from that which reason dictates. Uh, and also, quote, that if reason is rectified, the will is also rectified. The condemnation of these two propositions, as is well known, did much to contribute to the rise of medieval voluntarism. Yet, if the will is not determined by reason, then how can we avoid positing it simply as a capacity for deciding arbitrarily among alternatives? Such a view leads to at least two significant worries. One is that it makes the will, acts of will arbitrary and thus unintelligible. The other is it makes them not truly free. For we normally think of someone as acting freely precisely when his reasons can be understood. If it turns out that free choice is instead simply a random process operating in the mind, then it would seem that we are at the mercy of that random process rather than free agents. This was in essence the reply of the medieval intellectualists to the voluntarists, as it is the reply today of compatibilists to libertarians. It is in light of this debate that I find Maximus's treatment of free choice particularly intriguing. Maximus places choice in the sequence of mental operations after deliberation and judgment so that it is informed by the operations of reason. Yet it is not determined by them, for as I mentioned earlier, it operates like a vote in relation to the results of judgment. That is, the will takes these results into account while also deciding from within through its own spontaneous movement whether to accept them. Yet this movement is not arbitrary, for it is an expression of the will's intrinsic orientation toward goods that are in accordance with nature. Of course, it does not follow that, that the choice itself is in accordance with nature, far from it, but it is at least intelligible as an expression of this innate desire. Granted, any form of spontaneity always leaves a further question of why. In this case, why does the will express its innate desire in one way rather than another? I suspect that Maximus, if faced with this question, might refer to his teaching regarding, regarding the divine logoi and the ultimate human destiny of deification. As destined for deification, human beings must be spontaneous originators of their own character, because otherwise they would not share in that aspect of the divine nature that the Greek fathers called to autexousion, self-determination. This does not render each choice in isolation fully intelligible, but it does render intelligible why our acts of seeking to understand choice reach a limit we find in ourselves an image of the same mystery that we find in God. And this is, if not understanding, then something far better. Thank you, David. So we do have time now um, for uh, plenty of discussion. Again, um, on the schedule, uh, it says that we're going to end at 1.35, but we're not <clears throat> going to end at 1.35. We're going to go a little bit over that and just see how the discussion flows. So we'll, um, we'll just uh, uh, play it by ear, as we say uh, in America, um, to see when we will end. Okay? So the floor is open to questions. Yes, uh, Paul. Do we, are we have a microphone, or are we just going to go without the microphone? Go ahead, Paul. Just go ahead and speak loudly. This is for David. This is kind of following up. Uh, you presented, I think, very well the, the sort of the trajectory of maximum appropriation of the case of dealing with the notion of the will, practice, and desire. I don't think that's all going to address some new distinctions and some of that. The thing that always perplexes me is if we're talking about will and relation to the how does all the Paul. ecstatic and erotic dimension of the soul factor in? Where, at what point does that factor in to this conceptualization of the distinctive mm -hmm. factor of the Could you just repeat the last part of that, the question, just for the microphone? Um, how, how does his uh, understanding of the erotic and ecstatic dimension of the human soul, its openness to ecstasy, its openness to divine ecstasy, divine movement. How does that connect into his rational order of the will and his, his, his breakdown of the different dimensions, the different components within, mm -hmm. within the will? Yeah, um, that's a great question and others may want to comment too. Uh, what occurs to me is 
you know, if you think back to Dionysius and Divine Names, chapter 4, the two primary names he's dealing with there, God is the good, God is the beautiful. And I think when it comes to the theory of the will, Maximus primarily has in mind God as the good because he defines will as this innate tendency to seek the good, to seek our natural good. So it is a way of seeking God, but it's seeking God, if you will, under that particular description as the good, uh, whereas I think that, uh, as far as I'm aware at least, he doesn't bring into this context that other divine name, God is the beautiful, which is the one that really provokes eros within us. Uh, certainly elsewhere he does, but not within this discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, all three papers uh, have been extremely important uh, and uh, they're overlapping with uh, the paper I am going to give in many ways. Uh, I don't uh, intend to discuss all of them in detail. I just wanted to raise one question concerning gnomic will. And I'm referring particularly to uh, the paper of uh, Father Batrelos. Uh, is gnomi and gnomic will to be understood as post uh, Is it necessarily sinful? Uh, where does, does this idea come from? There, there, there can be two sources uh, in case of Maximus. If uh, it comes from uh, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, for example, it would have to be related to mutation, tropi. And in that case, according to Gregory of Nyssa, this is a, a characteristic of, uh, of creaturehood. All creatures are mutable because they've had a beginning. Now, uh, to say that uh, no, the, the other possibility would be uh, the distinction that Sherwood makes in the case of Maximus, uh, that uh, it's not that tropi does not refer to the nature, the human nature, but to the movement of the human nature uh, in the case of Maximus. Now, be it as it may, uh, to say that uh, economic will is post lapsarian uh, makes it difficult to understand how the fall took place in the first place. And there, if there was no economic will in Adam, why did he fall? Did he not fall by his economic will? In that case, economic will was there before the fall. And the other thing is that if we associate gnomic will so strongly with sin, we cannot understand uh, Maximus' uh, uh, recognition that human will is the only will we have and the only way we have to theosis. So all that Father Batrelos has said about freedom as not involving choice would seem to me to apply only to the eschata. There's no freedom of such kind in history. Gnomic will is part of uh, our creaturehood, our created existence. We cannot avoid that and we should not avoid it. I think that I fully agree with what you've said, although I'm not sure that um, Maximus's view um, is influenced by Gregory of Nyssa, but this is a historical point which is not of direct interest perhaps to us. Um, 
I would put it like this, that even Christ had a sinless gnomic will. I would be happy with this. It is true that before uh, the breaking out of the monothelite controversy, Maximus uh, spoke about gnomi in very positive terms. So for him, gnomi was a human act of willing by which one could conform to the divine will. So gnomi is depicted not only in negative, but also in positive ways. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Maximus would also speak about gnomic will in the Escata in his first opusculum. Now, I think uh, what happened is this. In the course of the mon monothelite controversy, Maximus wanted to, to deny, to, to refute the view that Christ had one will. A way of doing this was to make, make it impossible for this will to get any possible name. So he would say that this one will cannot be hypostatic because then Christ would have a different will from that of the Father and the Spirit. It cannot be natural because then Christ would be one nature and so on and so forth. In doing this, he responded to an argument of the monothelites according to which this one will had to be gnomic. So in his first opusculum, for the first time, he identified gnomic will as a fallen will in order to make it impossible for the monothelites to apply this name to the allegedly one will of Christ. So it was to some extent a kind of um, tactical, I would say, move on the part of Maximus in order to refute his opponents. But definitely, if we understand gnomic will as the realization of our natural human will in concrete, concrete acts of willing and decisions, I would say that this applies equally to man before the fall, and this is, as you correctly said, why man fell, because he made a bad use of his gnomic will, it applies to Christ himself, it applies to saints, to everybody. So it is a matter of how we define and understand economic will, on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, in, in, in our fallen uh, condition, our economic will is affected by sin. Not only by sin, but is affected uh, by sin as well. And as I, as, as I said earlier, Maximus builds on this his uh, anti monothelite argumentation for a very specific reason. Um, I'm going to allow also, um, even though the question wasn't directed to him, I'm, because um, his appendix uh, relates to this matter, I'm going to allow David uh, also to speak to this issue. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I agree entirely with what uh, Father Demetrius just said. Uh, and in fact, my thought is influenced largely by his book. But I, I do want to add a couple of points. It seems to me that so you find two different ways of defining both nome and nomic will in Maximus. Uh, one of them is morally neutral, and there's no reason at all that it should not be attributed to Christ. That's what I, the definitions I quoted in, in, in the part I read of my paper, uh, that nomic will is simply the particular manner of willing that belongs to an individual hypostasis. Clearly, Christ does have a nomic will in that sense. Uh, but the other sort of definition is one that uh, associates it with ignorance and the possibility for error. And that's when I think he is being more polemical and trying to sort of take that term away from his opponents. Um, and I quote those definitions in the appendix. What I would point out that I think is very interesting and important to realize historically, um, when he denies gnomic will to Christ, he also denies prohiresis. Uh, on the same grounds, the prohiresis, as he puts it within this context, and I think he's very, being very polemical here, he says prohiresis is necessarily a choice between good and evil. Um, that, I think, is not correct, <laughs> frankly. I mean, with all due reverence to St. Maximus. Um, I think if you look at the usage of the term uh, in earlier fathers, they attribute prohiresis to God, acting as creator of the world. Uh, St. Basil does in the Hexameron, and Gregor of Nyssa does in his work on the soul and resurrection and elsewhere. Uh, they have no difficulty in attributing prohiresis to God because they see it as simply a choice among alternatives which may all be good. 
Um, and this is from a philosophical point of view. It's very important because it gets to the understanding of divine freedom. That uh, uh, I don't think the fathers hold that sort of Leibnizian view that there is always one best alternative, and that's the one that God always takes. Uh, I think they see a real element of choice even within the divine life, and all the more so than within the life of Christ. Uh, so I, I, I would agree with a Father Demetrios that it's, it's really kind of a polemical use of the terms when he does try to deny those. Thank you. Uh, His Grace, Bishop Renato. Ja bih htio da se zahvalim e, svoj trojici izlagača na njihovom vidjenju i tumačenju svetomaksimovskih tekstova vezano za e, teme koje su izabrali. Ali moje pitanje se odnosi na, i upuš, upućeno je gospodinu Tolepsonu, e, po pitanju, ako sam ja dobro razumeo, e, pitanje ličnosti ako je on to rekao da je ličnost u stvari e, dar Boži u smislu da je ona već u umu Božjem dakle i pre stvaranja ako sam tako i da tu e, teo sam da u tom kontekstu pitam u kom bi tada kakva bi bila razlika e, svetomaksimovskih shvatanja logosa ili logosa čoveka ili uopšte logosa stvari i recimo Platonovih ideja ili tačnije ili možda konkretnije origenovi origenove interpretacije logosa stvari Your Grace, I'm sorry can you repeat the question? Poritena epena lavaneta to to rotima No, my, question, my question is about the person and definition of person. You had said that the person is the, the charis, uh, the, the gift of God, and uh, exists in God, the, the person of, of humanity. But in this, in this case, I, I have a question. What uh, different uh, is between uh, uh, Maximus uh, understanding the Logos uh, or Logi and uh, uh, Platon's ideas they own and, uh, and uh, uh, Origen's interpretation of, of this uh, uh, Platonic's ideas on the Logos ton, ton on the. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, I think that um, um, what exists in the divine mind or in God is uh, the divine contemplation of what it is to be you and me, the divine notion of what it is to be you and me and every human being. So. Um, I am created in such a way that uh, I have something to achieve, I think. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I should address what you said, but the second part of it, uh, which had to do with uh, how to conceive of the Logoi compared with Platonic ideas, I think that there is a major difference because, uh, well, first and foremost, I always had very many problems with figuring out exactly what the Platonic idea is. But uh, if one gets to Aristotle's interpretation of it, there seems to be some kind of uh, perfect patterns for things separated from individuals. But the divine logoi are God's, well, self-contemplation issuing in acts of will which institutes what we are in this world. Shall I uh, add to that? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, with a little more comment here. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that as well, if I may. Um, that's entirely correct. And 
Uh, you do have to remember that Maximus adopts from the definition from Dionysius of the divine Logoi as being acts of will, and the Platonic ideas are not acts of will. Um, so that's, that's already one very large difference. Uh, the other difference that I think accompanies that is that the Logoi are of individuals. There actually is a whole hierarchical or sort of ontological structure of the Logoi, but they reach down to the individual level, and each, of, each individual has those three Logoi of being, well-being, and ever-well-being, uh, whereas the Platonic ideas are only of, of kinds or natural, natural kinds, generally, uh, or general predicates. So um, logo, um, Logoi is a much more um, robust idea in that it's, it's, suited, it's suited to a, a personal creator who cares for each of us and has an intent for uh, each of us as individuals in a way that the Platonic conception is not. And even Origen, uh, Origen does introduce this concept of Logos into Christian theology, but uh, there's an, a major difference between Origen and Maximus here, that Origen says that the, the many Logoi are the one Logos, the second person of the Trinity. He simply draws that identity. This is in his commentary on John where he discusses the Logoi. Uh, Maximus in Ambiguous 7 is very deliberate and careful to say that that is true at the cataphatic level, but at the apophatic level, the one logos transcends the many logoi, as the, the creator does the creatures. And so uh, he maintains a kind of apophatic reserve as well in not identifying the second person, the Trinity, with, with the logoi. Oh. Milan Georgievich from the University of Skopje, Macedonia. I have two uh, questions. In fact, one comment and one question concerning uh, uh, the lecture of uh, Father Bartelos. Uh, it is uh, the comment concerns the point five uh, within the anthropological uh, uh, remarks. Uh, you speak about uh, Saint Nicholas Cabasilas. His uh, uh, his work uh, on the life in Christ, and you say that the first step of the life in Christ is the sacramental cleansing and restoration of humanity, and then follows the moral struggle that leads to holiness. So, uh, as much as I know, I think that uh, the story by Capacitus is a little bit more complex. Uh, for example, in the Mariological uh, sermons by Capacitus, we have uh, uh, something very interesting. There is. Uh, 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 there is a uh, part of the text where Cabasilas says uh, the, the human nature was created uh, uh, in order that the one person from this, uh, from this nature uh, comes to one level of moral uh, perfection and cleansing, etc. Uh, uh, that this person could uh, aha, what is uh, that this person could uh, be uh, uh, could could uh, uh, be the parent of God, so to say, uh, uh, in order God to take the uh, his uh, human nature from this person exactly. So in this in this uh, case we have uh, an opposite uh, an opposite uh, movement. We have the uh, moral perfection of the mother of God, and then we have the sacramental uh, uh, moment uh, with uh, the with the uh, with the uh, incarnation and the uh, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, then we have some remarks in the sixth sermon again uh, the the uh, the meaning of the uh, 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 preaching of the gospel etc as something that comes before the uh, uh, before the uh, before the sacramental uh, life so mm, i wouldn't say that uh, that the service and the moral perfection comes the first according to nicolas tabasilas but i think that there is kind of a feedback loop uh, maybe we can say that the moral uh, that uh, the sacramental life and the unity precedes the moral <coughs> life in the means of causa finalis. This is something that comes on the end, but it was in the beginning, in a similar way in which the uh, second Adam comes before the first Adam. So maybe in this way, but more in some meaning of uh, general feedback, not to say this precedes the other one. So this was a remark. 
And uh, a question concerns the previous point, and it is the point four about the apocatastasis, this uh, quotation from, uh, uh, Florovsky. Uh, from Florovsky. Did you maybe found a similar concept in the Western tradition? There is uh, something very similar in the Anglican theology of the 20th century by Clay Staples Lewis in his work. Have you maybe paid attention to something like this? Thank you. Well, let me first respond to the second question by saying no. I know nothing about him. Now, with regard to the first uh, comment or question, um, you probably know um, Nicolas Cabasilas' Mariology better than I do. And my feeling is that when we discuss about Mariology, we get into a big set of uh, questions and approaches that need very careful uh, consideration. But I'm pretty sure that in his book on the life in Christ, um, Cabasilas thinks along the lines I have described. I mean, in his first uh, 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 chapter of the book, he makes it very clear. Well, perhaps he's a bit ex extreme, but that, that, that what's, what he says, he makes it very clear that before baptism, man is, is, is dead. I mean, at times he sounds like a little bit of Lutheran there. So he says, before, before the sacramental transformation, uh, which takes place through the, the three introductory sacraments of baptism, chrismation, and, and the Eucharist, a man is nearly dead, and he, ca he can produce almost no good works. So he, he stresses very, very strongly the importance of sacramental regeneration. Then he talks about moral struggle, and in the end, he speaks about the character, the holy character that is formed on the basis of the sacraments through moral struggle. And this relates a little bit to the question of virtue ethics, which uh, we discussed earlier. So this is his fundamental uh, 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 argument. And I think it bears similarities to uh, Maximus's view on Christology because in, in, Maximus does not see Christ as Nestorius and Theodore of Obsestia did, namely as an individual struggling against his sinful desires and impulses in order to become at, at a certain point holy and totally uh, free from sin. But Christ is sinless and even more holy and deified from the very moment of, con of his conception because of his hypostatic unity um, with the divinity in the person of God the Logos. But then this is exemplified in his holy life in the way he deals with pleasurable or painful temptations and the apex of all this is of course his decision, human decision to obey the Father taken at the Garden of Gethsemane. So I see a parallel there uh, between the two, the, two think, the two thinkers, namely between what Maximus says on Christology and what Nicholas Cabasilas says in anthropology. Of course, yes, Cabasilas lives in a different period. He has some different problems. So I don't want to stress the parallelism uh, far too much, but I think we can see a parallel there anyway. I would like to thank for the excellent papers, and I would like to pose two questions that are also hypotheses of research. The one to Father Patrelos, and the second to uh, Professor Tolefsen. Uh, about the post-lapsarian character of Gnomi, I would like to ask if we could see Gnomi as due to the fragmentation of nature. So uh, to see Gnomi not as any kind of mutation, tropy, or any kind of ignorance, or any kind of individual determination, or any kind of choice, but um, uh, choices and mutations and ignorances that have to do with the fact that uh, the human nature is uh, fragmented after the fall. 
Uh, so this could mean that Adam, uh, if he had a, a Catholic nature before the fall, uh, he did not have uh, a gnomi, or at least that even if he did not have such a nature, that he could have the possibility to unite his nature. Uh, so in that case, we would see the post-Napsarian gnomi as the fact that uh, uh, we cannot but have a gnomi, which means that we cannot but have a sort of ignorance or mutation or choice that is due to the fact that each individual of us is not the full man, does not have the full humanity. Uh, and I wonder if this uh, concept of fragmentation could help us uh, have an insight uh, at Maximus' uh, view. In that case, of course, Christ does not have a gnomi because he has a Catholic nature, as his eminence, uh, Bishop of Pergamon, has also showed in his works. And then maybe Adam also did not have a gnomi because uh, he could have a chance to, to have a united Catholic nature. And uh, secondly, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Tolefsen if we could make a, a distinction between two Maximian terms of freedom, it is also interesting for, for the other two papers, between aftexusion and eleftheron, and uh, see aftexusion or self-determination as something inherent to um, to the, to the dynamis, uh, to, to, um, initial, to an initial stage where man can determine his own uh, uh, path in life, while a left heron as a liberation, uh, which is due to divine grace, and then to something uh, like an energia that is uh, eschatological and it is um, a gift of God. So if there is, if we could make such a distinction between the two terms, after exclusion and the left term, which is theologically significant. Yes, I can see we are running a bit short of time. Anyway, thank you for the question, but I don't think I would agree with what the question suggests. Um, well, of course, Maximus says that and uh, there is a fragmentation of nature because we oppose each other through our gnomi. And he says that as we are one in nature, we should be also one in gnomi. So we should love each other so that to be one in love through the conformity of our gnome to the will of, of God. But um, I would, I, would, I, would, I would say that Maximus clearly sees Adam as an individual. Well, biblical scholarship and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, the progress of science should make us rethink a little bit about what exactly this may mean, but that's another question. I think he sees, uh, as most fathers, all our fathers, I think, uh, Adam as an individual. And I'm pretty sure that um, uh, Maximus sees Christ as an individual in the sense that he bore a particular human nature and not a generic one. There is no generic human nature, actually, in, in a certain sense. So I don't think that part of your um, thinking is something with which I would easily agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I suppose that um, it's much better that David tries to answer your question. In a sense, I think that uh, David and I will agree on the basic ontological description uh, of uh, how these terms are applied. But when it comes to uh, these concepts of will, I suppose that he is in a much better position to try to address them than I am. Um, go ahead, David. Yeah. Well, let's see. So the question was about the difference between Toat Exusion and Eleutheria, right? Um, <laughs> there is a difference. Um, I, they, one thing to recall is that um, Toat Exusion is an aspect of the image of God. Uh, you find this in Gregory of Nyssa and, and even as early as Irenaeus, actually, that um, uh, 
there are two aspects to the image of God, rationality and self-determination, and they go hand in hand. We have Tautoxusion because we are rational beings and therefore able to consider our lives and to make choices in light of that. Uh, I think the fathers tend to use, so Tautoxusion is something intrinsic even to our fallen being, whereas Eleutheria is more of something to be achieved. It's freedom, you know, this goes back to the Gospel of John where where Christ says, um, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, but otherwise we're slaves to sin, and the fathers are very attuned to that. Now, I haven't done an exhaustive study of those words, but that's my sense of it in general. We have one more. Uh, I have two questions. Um, first one for Professor Tollefson. It wasn't clear for me from the talk whether you're ready to accept the difference between... Don't, don't hold it so close to your mouth. Hold it Not so close. It. Okay. Um, it wasn't clear for me from the talk whether you are ready to accept the difference between two concepts, namely individual and hypostasis. On one hand, um, and, and the quotes show this, individual can be seen uh, as an essence with some particular properties. And in this sense, uh, even animals and objects can be seen as individuals. And Maximus says this, especially in his disputation with Pyrrhus. But uh, you define hypostasis here um, as someone uh, who um, 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 acts in accordance with the logos, which is something more than um, having just a particular properties. So, um, do you accept the difference between the two terms, individuals and hypostasis, or do you think they are the same? I don't like that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we can skip it. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I think that uh, somehow I started out uh, wondering what on earth is the difference. Um, well, mm -hmm. of course I know that modern theologians and philosophers would like to see a difference. But I, couldn't, I have never been convinced about, uh, the, by those who try to somehow ex show to me that um, this distinction is uh, prominent also in, for instance, the Cappadocian Fathers of Maximus the Confessor. And that is a major problem. And therefore, I thought that, uh, well, I have read my Heidegger, so I have a lot of these notions in mind. But, well, I try to put together what I can find in texts, in this case, um, St. Maximus. And I have to admit that uh, there is something strange happening here, because it seems that the concept of essence, in a sense, <coughs> turns out, uh, when you try to figure out what the hypothesis is, to be somehow um, very important to establish the whole notion of human beings as beings in communion with others. So I think that uh, the, the dimension of communion, for instance, which has been discussed when it comes to the concept of person, mm -hmm. stems from Maximus concept of nature or essence. But this is not just an essentialistic explanation of something. I think somehow there ent you enter into a field in which um, you won't have to conceive, it seems to me at least there are indications in what I have read now. I put it forward for you. You can see in the manuscript I wrote that there are certain rather dynamic aspects with the way Maximus copes with these things compared with others who just seems to build up certain sets of concepts. Um, and, but there is very little, so to say, to build on. But there are indications, personal properties, whatever is that, for instance. And this use of the... Um, uh, the pronoun, the, the um, indefinite or interrogative, I don't know what it could be, 
pronoun which makes it possible to distinguish between something and someone. So certainly he was on his way to something, I'm quite sure. Uh, and it seems to me that, uh, well I know my Aristotle, but it seems to me that here uh, there is some indications that we are on our way to a, let me put it this way, warmer concept of a human being than in earlier philosophy. I'm going to use my prerogative as a chair to ask you a follow-up question. Um, I know we're all tired, but just very quickly. The way it, uh, it plays out in, in sort of modern discourses, you know, is that individual is a-relational, while person is supposed to be a modern person is a person who's supposed to be relational. And what struck me about your presentation of Maximus is that <clears throat> now, hypostasis is both something kind of connected to the individual, but it's also relational in the sense that if there's a distinct, if each hypostasis has a distinct logi that is itself connected to other logi in and through the logos, but in some sense he is moving towards an understanding of hypostasis of a person as relational. So, I, I don't know, does he, would he reject sort of the modern understanding of individuality as a-relational, or he has a much more nuanced or complicated sense of that? Or? I couldn't answer that. The last part of the question is impossible to answer, of course, but uh, uh, then we should have to ask him. Uh, <laughs> um, but you, you, you point to, so to say, you, you um, point to the real core of the issue, because you also now uh, put into your question all the, those terms which one has to cope with when one shall figure out what this is about. And it seems to me that he is on his way to something which probably could, one could claim um, has certain features that will uh, make it similar at least with some modern approaches to the concept of person. But I think that the communion part of it is in his thought uh, the essence or nature part of it, in the hypothesized condition in which man, so to say, also recognizes his interconnectedness. So there is a, well, then I have to say, there seems to be a spiritual dimension to it as well. Okay, thank, I think we can thank our presenters for a really three excellent papers yeah. and discussion as well. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so now we have lunch, and uh, we reconvene at um, three at uh, three thirty. Is it that late? Really? Three hours. What did it sound? Fifteen thirty, right? Yeah.